Hi YouTube, my name is Patrick, and today we're going to take a look at Fedora Silver Blue 38. I'm very excited about this distribution. I'm a big fan of immutable desktops as a concept. So let's dig in, let's take a look and see what makes Fedora Silver Blue 38 a great release and a wonderful candidate for your desktop. And we'll talk about what makes it different, talk about its uh, security stance, and a few other things. So let's dig right in. You can see on my screen here we are on a Fedora Silver Blue 38 desktop. So, so the headlining features are you've got kernel 6.3.8, you've got Pipewire on board for your audio, you've got Wayland for your display compositor, you've got GNOME 44 as your desktop environment, and it supports FlatHub out of the box. So speaking of things out of the box, let's take a look at what applications come with it. So for the terminal, we have the usual GNOME terminal here. So we can do, you know, like get some information about our kernel, right? That's all well and good. But we also have Firefox out of the box. So Firefox is the venerable browser of most Linux distributions, and it serves its purpose quite well here. I will note that Firefox is not a flat pack, but rather a natively installed package. Now, the reason that's important will be a little bit more obvious once we talk about what makes Silverblue unique. Other than Firefox, uh, we have Nautilus as our file browser. So, you know, that's all well and good. It functions just fine. Beyond that, you have stuff like the contacts book, the weather application, calendar, clock, extensions, calculator, the usual affair of stuff. Uh, all of it is designed very well and cohesively. All of it feels like it came from the same design team. And I, although they are a bit simplistic at times, you'll notice they don't have a whole lot of features, but they do what they're supposed to do very well. And if you do need something a little more advanced, then that's what the other applications you can download are for. So I've teased this a little bit, but let's talk about what makes Silverblue unique. So Fedora Silverblue uses an immutable architecture. So what does that mean? Well, let me show you. So I've prepared this diagram to help illustrate what's going on here. So. Your base system is Fedora Silverblue 38. That root file system is read only, and it's installed on ButterFS. The home directory is writable, and the, it's, the Etsy directory is editable as well. So the base system itself, though, is read only. Now, when you update your system, what happens is it creates a snapshot of your existing system, and then it applies the update to that snapshot. Then whenever you reboot, it boots into the fresh snapshot. And if something goes wrong, it's very easy to roll back to the previous one. And it'll even do it automatically for you in some cases. So that's what makes it immutable. The idea is that it's impossible for you to render the computer in an unworkable state due to a software issue. So, is, but you might imagine, you know, what do you do for programs? If you can't write to the system, where do your programs go? Well, the solution to that is flat packs. Flat packs are containerized applications that live in a little sandbox, and they come packaged with their own libraries and such. Uh, so that's running on top of the flat pack runtime and its libraries that it also uses to support these uh, applications. And all of that's running on top of the read-only system. So your applications are able to function up here because they can write to their little sandbox environment and they're isolated from one another. And you can, with Flatpak, you can actually control the permissions on your applications very easily. So there's an application called FlatSeal. You just install that and then you're off to the races. You can very granularly control what each and every flat pack is able to do. Now, sometimes you're going to need immutable environments, like a lot of command line tools aren't available as flat packs. For that, you have toolboxes. Toolboxes are essentially Podman containers that are very closely integrated with the host system. So it's basically like running a little miniature copy of Fedora 38 in a terminal window and then you can do whatever you need to do to it uh, right from there. But it has some quality of life stuff like 
your home directory from the host system is accessible to the toolbox container. So because of that, you're able to, of course, manipulate and work with your files that you have on your host system directly from the toolbox container. Uh, so keep in mind that there are a few things punched through the, a few holes punched there as far as its security goes. They're not perfectly isolated. They share, well, for one thing, the kernel, but that's not really a security issue. Uh, but the fact that it can read and write your home directory, just be aware of that before you run a random script on one of these. Now, you can set up a, a, as many toolboxes as you like, and you can configure them differently so that they have different permissions on the system. If you're interested in learning more about Podman and containerization, let me know by leaving a comment down below. I'd love to uh, dig into that and take a look. Then your third option for applications are layered RPM applications. So this is when it's not available as a flat pack, it's not going to work in a toolbox, well then you have the option to layer it on top of that read-only system and it will update and be captured in snapshots just like the rest of the read-only system. Uh, so the ButterFS snapshots that it does integrate into the bootloader so whenever you turn on your computer, then it comes up with a little menu where you can say, I want to boot into this snapshot, or this snapshot, or this snapshot, and you can actually pin snapshots to that menu, and that gives you the ability to experiment and then roll back if you don't like what something does. Uh, so let's talk about security. So the read-only file system architecture makes malware that leverages writing to the system directories basically useless. So what I mean by that is if you have like some crypto miner and it's trying to, you know, save itself in the bin directory of the system and then make a cron job to run that, well, it's not going to work because the system is read-only. So having that read-only system does give you a lot of security advantages but it also comes with some disadvantages. We'll talk about that in just a moment. As far as your application security goes, Flatpaks provide sandboxing for each application, as we saw, and you can granularly control those permissions. So, toolboxes provide a pretty safe environment uh, for experimenting and installing command line tools. When it comes to security vulnerabilities, Fedora usually patches uh, high or medium severity ones within a few days. So you do receive security patches very often and very promptly. The Fedora security team is extremely transparent. They are so open about every security issue, what's done to address it, how it's being handled, when they find out, what you need to do. They're extremely good at communicating everything as far as the security goes. I, I often say you should not measure the security of a project by the number of vulnerabilities that come out for it. You should measure the security of a project by how promptly and completely those vulnerabilities are patched and also how well everything about them is communicated. And as far as those aspects go, the Fedora team knocks that out of the park. Uh, you also have SE Linux configured out of the box here. Uh, so that's pretty good as far as just some basic uh, mandatory access control system stuff goes. I say basic, but it's actually quite extensive and really useful. Uh, so definitely keep SE Linux enabled. It might be annoying, but if you learn how to work with it, it'll save you a lot of headache in the future, and it just helps keep everything secure. Uh, so also, as far as the firewall, you get Firewall D included. Uh, I would recommend installing a third-party firewall like Portmaster. It's just a little bit easier to work with. Firewall D is all commands line, and it's kind of clunky and it's, it's just harder to work with than necessary, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so, so the read-only file system is good for security, right? Well, that's the thing. Because you have a read-only root file system, it's not compatible with most antivirus software. And I believe that you should run an antivirus on your Linux systems. I actually work with a lot of Linux malware. I collect it as a kind of a hobby, and it's definitely out there and it definitely runs on your system unless there's something to stop it. So, no antivirus, but more resilient against viruses. You know, you're gonna have to make an educated 
an educated decision on if where your trade-offs are going to be, what works best for your use case. Something interesting, Firefox is installed as a native application, not as a flat pack. So what that means is, uh, is that it's not sandboxed like all the other flat pack applications. Now, this one seems a little obvious to me. Why wouldn't you want to use the flat pack version of Firefox? But then, you know, as far as integrations with the desktop go, like being able to call to your desktop password manager program from an extension, or being able to install extensions from the GNOME extensions website, that doesn't work with the Flatpak, so I kind of get why they shipped it with the native one. So let's talk about the user experience. Uh, Fedora Silverblue is extremely easy to use. You can hit the super key on the keyboard and it gives you this nice expose of all of your open windows on your desks on your desktop. You can use keyboard shortcuts to navigate back and forth between these virtual desktops and it's just it's just a very nice experience. You know there's not a lot to it. Uh, so you have the app drawer here which shows you all of your installed applications. So this is going to look very similar to anybody who has used iOS, specifically iPad OS. This desktop paradigm is extremely similar to how iPad OS presents itself with the dock at the bottom, title bar at the top, app home screen that you can go to. It, it, it is very reminiscent of iPad OS. Uh, so in a nutshell, this interface is simple and clean. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of options. It doesn't overwhelm you with information. Everything is very functional. The quick settings menu here lets you switch between Bluetooth devices right from that menu. Same with Wi-Fi. And you can even mess with your VPN from here. Uh, so you can also switch your power mode and even toggle the dark style. So we could turn that off and then open a program. You'll see the dark mode is off. And the dark mode is so well implemented. A beautiful little animation. Really well done. And the whole OS is full of nice little treats like that. So you also have this notification shade, you have your application menu, and then an activities button which shows you that overview. I've added a couple extensions here, one to show desktop icons, and the other is to display this kind of system information up here in the top bar. So that's one thing about GNOME is that it's very extensible and GNOME 44 didn't really break extensions that badly. Uh, something to note though, there's no minimize and maximize buttons. You only get a close button. So I get the rationale behind this to maximize you double click it so you don't really need a whole other button for that. And what about minimize? So the idea here is that minimizing programs is a bad habit. Instead of minimizing a program, you should either move it to another virtual desktop and switch to it when you need to use it, or close it, because you shouldn't have programs running in the background eating up resources unnecessarily. If you're not going to interact with a program, why have it running? So I, I get that. It's to encourage good habits, but that leaves only the close button. I think the minimize button is useful. It's kind of a headache that it's not here, but I live without it. You can add it back pretty easily, but by default it's not there. And another thing is the dock is kind of worthless. So if you hover over an icon in the dock, it doesn't show you the open windows for that program. And also, if you have multiple windows for a program open, like if we have two for Firefox here, there's no indication that the second window is open. Now you can right click on it and then you have this list of open windows right here. And you know, that's fine, but there's no thumbnails. It doesn't have little screenshots of them. It, it's just kind of hard to work with. And yeah, the dock is just, it's serviceable. It'll work. And if you're used to using an iPad or something, it's not too different, but still, it's it's not a very useful dock. So let's talk about application availability. An OS is no good if you don't have programs for it, right? Well, thankfully, all the software that's compatible, well, most of the software that's compatible with Fedora Linux is also compatible with Silverblue, either as a flat hub, or, sorry, either as a flat pack or as a 
package you can install in a toolbox. So, you know, most things are available as flat packs these days. Now, I want to point out something flat packs aren't perfect. So, this website, flatkill.org, kind of obvious where the bias is, they talk about some issues with flat packs. So, the sandbox often isn't configured as strictly as it could be out of the box. That's something you can fix with flat seal to tweak your flat pack permissions. Uh, security updates are also questionable, apparently. So you can get around this by looking at FlatHub and only installing applications that have gotten updates recently. And with regular cadence, it shows you right there on the website. So if we go to FlatHub and look at this music visualizer, you'll see the most recent update here. Well, somewhere on here it shows you how often it's updated, so it's useful information, so keep that in mind. Yeah, so those are some issues with Flatpak. You can mitigate them pretty well. Just be, be conscious of what you're installing and when. But I did want to point that out. And then there's also integration with other services. So if you have an Android phone, Linux integrates great with that. It'll push through your notifications, copy text. You can even do stuff like screen share over an ADB bridge, Android debug bridge bridge. But anyway, so it, it also has Google Drive integration and you can connect to SMB shares, basic stuff. It has support for consumer Microsoft accounts. So, you know, your Outlook email address, that, that'll work fine. There's no OneDrive though. And it doesn't work at all with iCloud or Microsoft 365 business accounts that is not integrated into the system at all. But it does have great native integration for Nextcloud. So Nextcloud is a totally viable option. All in all, I would say that Fedora 38 is a pretty good desktop environment. Sorry, it's a pretty good operating system with a great desktop environment installed. It has all of the applications you could possibly need. It's safer than most Linux distributions. You're not gonna break it. You'll never be in a situation where the software on your computer caused it to stop working. It's rock solid stable. I've been running Fedora since Fedora 32, and ever since then I've always had a Fedora box. And let me tell you, these things are solid. Very, you know, Ubuntu's gotten kind of buggy these days. It used to be the gold standard for a desktop, but I'm not sure what happened, but man, it's just kind of, kind of buggy now. And you don't get any of that weirdness with Fedora. It's a very nice GNOME experience. If you're, and it's very similar to, again, iPad OS. So the idea of the immutable file system, the immutable read-only file system, that's what iPad OS does. So it's similar to iPad OS in the application sandboxing, the immutable system and the very tight controls around everything. And also similar in that you can't install an antivirus on an iPad. You know, people don't talk about iPads being insecure. Maybe that's not such a big deal. So something to keep in mind. But overall, this is a great distribution of Linux and it is my number one rated desktop operating system, Fedora Silverblue. It is a great choice for anybody who just wants a cutting edge, but rock solid desktop experience. I just want to note that I don't take any sponsors or advertisement money from any of this. I never will. This channel is purely to share information and produce content for you. So if you enjoyed, it would mean a lot to me if you could leave a like and maybe even hit the comment button down below. So. Anyway, my name is Patrick. I'll see you next time.